Welcome back to the arcade. Over the next hour or so we are going to continue to take a look into the incredible past professional wrestling video games, starting at 1998. And at this point, let's just see where we end up. If you didn't watch part one, well, you've only skipped about 15 years worth of history. But here are the cliff notes on that period. The WWF reigned supreme, until the WCW got together with a video game corporation called the Aki Corporation. I used the word corporation twice there in that same sentence, and that's very unprofessional. A company that would be very important in the coming years as we look into the strange time that is 1998. You see, 1998 in video games is one of the years that I could definitely talk about for hours. Not only did it give us some of the best professional wrestling video games, but it also was a total and complete shift for video games as a whole. Metal Gear Solid, a title that I personally consider one of the best games ever made, was released and introduced many different elements to gaming that were not seen previously. And I'm not just talking about the incredible gameplay, I'm talking about the cinematic cutscenes rendered in-game using the in-game graphics engine, voice acting used throughout, as well as trying to send an actual message to the player about the kind of violence that they're dishing out. And if you're not a Metal Gear Solid fan, well, 1998 also saw the release of Resident Evil 2, which, God knows, I've spoken about enough at this point. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, also a game known by many people as their personal favourite and one of the best ever made, as well as the third Tomb Raider game, the first Sonic Adventure title, Tekken 3, Marvel vs Capcom, Spyro the Dragon, Half-Life and Medieval. I know I've spoken about stacked years in the past, 2004 personally is one of my all-time favourites, but 1998 is a true standout throughout history. Why am I going on about these non-wrestling titles? I'm just trying to give you some serious background before we go forward. You see, as niche as wrestling titles are, video games at this point were achieving new highs and the overall opinion on gaming as a whole started to turn towards the more serious. But let's turn our attention back to pro wrestling as a whole. Cat. Oh my god, hi. You want? Uh, you can be in the video, I don't mind. Cat. Professional wrestling at the time, in 1998, saw Shawn Michaels as a WWF champion, coming out of the Montreal Screwjob, stealing the title from Bret Hart. Now, in January, HBK would suffer a career-ending injury that would put him out for four entire years. Basically making the starting point of the Attitude Era, a time where wrestling was at its height in popularity, going forward without both Bret and Shawn Michaels, two guys who were fixtures of the WWF for nearly 10 years at that point. The WWF would look to a crop of new main eventers, and would find those stars in Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, Mankind, the newly debuted Kane, as well as a whole new heap of talent, including the Hardy Boys, Edge and Christian, and a few others. 1998 was a true turning point in the world of professional wrestling, but would it be a turning point in the world of professional wrestling video games? Or would the WCW continue its truly devastating reign at the top of the world of gaming? Let's find out. WCW Nitro released on January 15, 1998, and was the first title in an incredibly busy year for wrestling fans across the world. Hosting 64 characters as well as 37 more managers and valets, this title has 101 characters in total, but a large percentage of those belong to the N64 version. Yo brother, you think you got what it takes? You know I tricked you before, I'm gonna trick you again, but this time the torture is gonna last longer on the Hollywood Walk of Shame. Today we'll be taking a look at the PlayStation release which came first. Like WCW vs The World, WCW Nitro was published by THQ, but was actually developed by a different company. Whereas vs The World was developed by Aki, the same company that developed World Tour and Revenge on the N64, WCW Nitro was developed by Inland Productions, a company that normally produced fishing and hunting games. This meant that the game both looked and played completely different from the N64 titles which seemed like a really confusing decision to make, seeing as the games on Nintendo's console had not only been well received, but also had sold really well. Why Aki was bounced from WCW Nitro is unknown, but it was to the game's detriment in many ways. The game was actually ready for release in 1997, but Versus the World was still selling well at that point, and THQ didn't want to release another WCW game to the market when that one was already really well performing. 
so they delayed the release until early 1998, which led to a few of the wrestlers' gimmicks and characters being somewhat outdated as a result. Admittedly, this was less of an issue in WCW, as their roster tended to change far less than the WWF's, with the overall staleness of the product ultimately being a contributing factor to the wane in popularity the company suffered from 1999. But it's a shame that the game was essentially forced into being outdated when it didn't need to be due to cynical reasons. By the time WCW Nitro was released on both PC and N64, the roster was actually updated for those titles. WCW Nitro sold relatively well and received mostly mixed reviews, though the official UK PlayStation magazine, my favourite at the time, actually gave it a 5 out of 10. Though the title did continue to sell so well that we eventually got a Greatest Hits label in the US. Though it didn't get a Platinum label in the UK, probably due to the fact that we have higher standards or something, who can say? WCW Nitro uses a system similar to fighting games more than a wrestling one, with each wrestler having a selection of moves that you execute by putting in button combinations at the right time. Although this very slightly predates Warzone, Warzone had the ability to execute this in a way that can still be fun to play due to having some fluidity. WCW Nitro is so stiff and unresponsive that importing the codes is far more laborious, and it's often unclear just how close you have to be in order to execute them successfully. Though I have to be completely honest, this game is way better than I thought it would be. I was genuinely surprised at how it actually looks and plays. The graphics, for one thing, really aren't that bad. Sure, the audience in the arena doesn't look too great, but I have no problem with the player models whatsoever. They're fairly decent recreations of what they're meant to represent. The gameplay itself, despite its obvious problems, also isn't as bad as I thought it would be. I actually had fun playing the first matchup as Kevin Nash against DDP. I hit buttons at random and Six Pack ran in to help me, so I ended up googling Nash's finisher move and hitting it first time. Though that's not to say that this grappler's grappling is any good. Take a look at Warzone, for instance. A wrestler will reach out or lunge forward when you input the correct combination to pull up a move. So even if you're too far away or not in the right place, you will still be able to see where you would need to be in order to make the move actually work next time. However, in WCW Nitro, your wrestler will just gormlessly stand there doing nothing. So you won't know if the failure to execute the move was due to you putting in the combination wrong, or because you were in the wrong place as you aren't given any feedback to suggest one way or another. To sum up the gameplay, it's just a lack of feedback when it comes to playing WCW Nitro, with there often feeling like a major delay in your wrestler doing anything, even when it comes to simple things like moving around or in and out of the ring. In my second bout of the evening, this time playing as the giant in the tournament mode, I surprisingly started off against Hogan himself, somebody you'd assume would be final boss territory. This time around I spammed some hits and tried some random move combinations to see if I could hit the choke slam that Big Show wouldn't shut up about in his rant. You think you got the courage to step in the ring? I think you're gonna wind up with a snap net from the choke slam. Unfortunately, this wasn't meant to be. To give you an example of what Giant's moves actually are, I am pressing for the choke lift. Up, triangle, square. While standing next to an opponent and choke slam, up, X, circle, but getting nothing out of it, unfortunately, which is a shame. Also, Stevie Ray's model is absolutely hideous. I take back what I said about the graphics being passable. I do find it kind of hilarious that there's absolutely no move list in the pause menu as well. Whilst playing through the tournament mode, a random Medusa ran in during my match with Eddie Guerrero. I could certainly say that I wasn't expecting that. This game kind of flew by until I got up to the edge fight against Six, and he really handed me my ass. Hey, anytime you feel froggy, man, I'll slap on the buzz killer and rip your shoulder right out of socket. Wolfpack style! Lex immediately after even gave me my first loss, but it was up to Nash as the 10th straight fight. Honestly, the lack of selling really, really hurts this game. They hit a huge move on you, and as soon as you're up, you can attack them again. It's the same for them, unfortunately, as they hit a huge move, then immediately begin hitting another one against you. So, I finished the tournament mode. What did I win? A big show propaganda baggage. We see him beating up Muta, the Steiners, and other people, and then it's over. Thanks. As noted previously, the roster of WCW Nitro is very different between the PlayStation 1 and the Nintendo 64 versions of the game. The N64 version was released in 1999 and featured the updated roster from the game's sequel, WCW NWO Thunder. This roster also includes some referees, commentators, and a whole bunch of weird fantasy characters, like Ecto, a ghost, Bones, a literal skeleton, Whitey, a snowman, Santa Claus himself, and some weird polygon thing in a Japanese schoolgirl outfit called Annie Mae. Oh, I, I get it, I get it. Oh, and a further secret code will grant you even more characters, but they're all staff who worked on the game, stroking their own egos and giving themselves cool or intentionally bad wrestling names. 
The problem is that in order to unlock everyone, you have to complete the game over and over again with wrestlers that, aside from the odd move, will mostly all just wrestle the exact same. At least in a fighting game, there is usually a difference of fighting styles between the characters, so each venture into the arcade mode can at least have its own flavour to it. In WCW Nitro, once you complete the game with one wrestler, you're not going to find it much different when you complete it with another. So overall, I actually didn't hate this experience. It was almost fun in a way. I think if it was re-released today for the Xbox Live Marketplace or something like that, I might even be tempted to pick it up and give it a quick run through. For the achievements. Oh yeah. Hey there! How'd you like to get power, Bob? Come on, pick me. I'm begging you, pick me. Please pick me. <laughs> it's time now to talk about WWF Warzone, released for the PlayStation in July. 1998. The acclaimed series is definitely polarizing in presentation and in gameplay. People either love these titles or hate them. And now I'll be honest, it's a detail that I'll touch on later, but the main reaction to this title tends to come from whether or not you played literally any other wrestling game that came out either before or after WWF Warzone or Attitude. WCW vs NWO World Tour came out the year prior to this title. And if you've played that, or Smackdown, No Mercy, or any of the other WCW Aki titles like Revenge, you're probably going to dislike this game due to its completely different control style from what was established in the Aki titles, as well as an emphasis on slow, realistic, sluggish simulation and a different style of combat, this time spelt with a K. Warzone was developed by Iguana Entertainment, the former sculptured software. The people behind WWF Raw, Royal Rumble, Super WrestleMania, and several other titles that I previously mentioned. So these guys do know a thing or two about professional wrestling video games. Not only that, but their focus was also on bringing over several other big name fighting games into the home console market. These included the first three Mortal Kombat games. This caught the eye of Acclaim, who brought the company and renamed them as Iguana West, then renamed them again to Iguana Entertainment the following year. Now, based on feedback from wrestling fans, the team behind porting the former arcade games was setting out to create something based on simulation, not quick-based arcade-like action, and they really nailed that idea. There is absolutely nothing fast-paced about WWF Warzone. This, again, was the point. They wanted the game to be truly grounded and realistic, having wrestlers feel heavy and stiff to move and perform various wrestling moves, something that honestly drags the game down entirely. Iguana West, a team of 20 people, looked to the WCW titles that came out around the time and decided to do something entirely different to that of the other company's offerings. In an interview with PlayStation Magazine Online, Justin Towns, the WWF lead programmer, and Vince Bracken, the game's project manager, both had this to say. We were trying to do more of a sim, especially compared to what we had done before. And it seems that's what all the wrestling fans really wanted, so that's what we leaned toward. At the same time, we wanted a game to play a little faster than real wrestling, so it would be more fun to play as a game. And we felt that the other wrestling games are a little sluggish, and we didn't want that feeling. Do you mean sluggish in character response, or do you mean the length of the game? Because certainly the length of the game, while adjustable, seems quite long. Well, yeah, both, actually. I would always get bored playing previous wrestling games. I wanted something a little bit faster. And do you feel like you've achieved the speed you were looking for? Yes, I think we did. Absolutely. It's a perfect game. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's not slow, there's not a bunch of ridiculous button combinations, the hardcore match is just flawless. We didn't make a shit game at all. I honestly disagree with what Justin is saying here. I really don't think there's anybody on the face of the earth that would say that WWF Warzone performs faster than the other games out around that time. Though you could say that he nailed down the boring, sluggish simulation style that they were aiming for. So, bonus points, I guess. You did it. Good job. Well done. You're a hero. You're the man. Nice work, Justin. It's also worth mentioning that Iguana Entertainment was a team of around 20 people, splitting the team in half to work on each version, the PlayStation and N64 versions. This interview is actually quite a time capsule, as they go into major detail about how the PlayStation offers up so much more in terms of storage for FMVs, music, commentary, better music, and something that would overall be the downfall of the N64 in the coming years, the dependency on the cartridge as a whole. 
The main menu of Warzone is pretty incredible, basically putting you in a dark, dingy warehouse that could easily be confused for an endgame stage in a Resident Evil game. There's a biography menu which allows you to take a look at wrestlers' models in full 3D, as well as listening to their theme song and taking a look at what their finishing move is. Warzone is also one of the first wrestling games to contain a proper creative wrestler mode. Although other titles allowed people to edit pre-existing wrestlers, there wasn't anything true like this. This title had a completely crazy random selection as well, allowing you to take a look at the truly monstrous things that can be created here, both male and female. The roster here is fairly interesting, giving us the obvious guys like Taker, Owen, Bret Hart, Shamrock, the Headbangers, Rock, Austin and Kane, as well as three versions of Mankind. But Bret's the odd man out here. The Montreal Screwjob, as I mentioned previously, happened in November, so this title was getting released in July, and including Bret is a really weird one. That's an almost 8 month gap between the two events. Now the worst thing in my mind when it comes to the roster is the weird little details that are essentially missing. For example, HBK's wrist tape is gone. HBK and Brett's hair is either tied up or just very straight. And for whatever reason, through a very CRT, you could probably look past these tiny details. Each wrestler does have their own alternative attire available, which is pretty sweet for the time. It even gives us Kane's badass inverted attire which may not have even existed in 97. The loading screens into matches are pretty cool looking, they're basically just matchup screens, showing us a render of our selected star and their opponent. I love the charm to these, they're great. Now once a match starts, or is about to start, Vince and Jair introduce themselves and go on to introduce the wrestlers that we're playing as. Welcome to the Warzone, this capacity crowd is on their feet. I'm Vince McMahon. I'm Jim Ross. It ought to be a great matchup. From the bowels of hell, King. The sky's the limit for this crimson beast. Bret Hart is one of the most technically sound wrestlers in the sport. This isn't about popularity. He's the king of the hill. After the match ends, the wrestler just stands there. And that's it. The wrestler you defeat makes their way out of the ring behind you so the hard cam can see them and your wrestler may even look over his shoulder in order to get a look at their fallen enemy. It's weird. Where's the music? Why isn't their entrances in versus mode anyways? So strange. The main options in store here for us are the challenge mode, versus mode, tag team mode, cage match and the weapons match. This was years before table matches in the WWF and only a few years removed from HPK and Scott Hall's ladder match at Mania. So they could have worked on that kind of match for this game. But that honestly would have been a complete and utter train wreck. I can only imagine how difficult that would have been to try and include in this bulky slow motion weird title. Challenge mode is where you'll unlock new attires for wrestlers, as well as cheats and a few new guys. Unfortunately, this is only two actual WF guys, Dude Love and Cactus Jack. The other wrestlers that you unlock are Ring Crew and Trainers. Low will return to the challenge mode later. There's the one-on-one -on -one mode, which is exactly what you think it is. A straightforward one-on-one -on -one match, nothing too fishy. A tag team match, which has two men taking on another two-men team. This time with fairly decent reduction in quality of the player models. Weapon matches are hardcore matches, whereas steel cage matches are no rope steel cage matches, for whatever reason, where you can only win by exiting the cage. The challenge mode is a match-up mode where you are tasked with defeating a number of wrestlers, randomly selected from the ones mentioned previously. There's a totally random ranking system, which has guys like Thrasher above guys like Brett, The Rock and Austin for whatever reason. Occasionally, you'll have guys you've already defeated come out of the woodwork and challenge you for a singles match, which could be a weapons match or a cage match, having each WWF superstar standing in a room located in the back of Raccoon City, just meters away from the tyrant, ranting about how they're going to defeat you, and it's a truly good counterpoint, especially when compared to the rants that we saw previously in the WCW titles. After winning the WWF title, you are tasked with defending it, just once, before the challenge mode comes to an end. This title also thankfully includes a practice mode, something that will really come in handy as this game is fairly tricky to pick up. Thankfully, I have my experience with WCW Nitro still fresh in my mind, allowing me to hit some random combinations of buttons to pull off certain moves. Now something quick on the controls as well that I want to put in here is that WCW Nitro kind of has you hit like up, triangle, circle, X to do a move. Whereas this game, Warzone, and I assume Attitude as well following, you kind of just hit like up, down, X, left, right, square. Uh, the Tombstone Pile Driver, I believe, is up, down, triangle for the Undertaker and down, up, triangle for Kane, which is pretty cool. But there's that's one of the main differences between this title and WWE Nitro. Nitro will literally have you press a number of different buttons to hit a move, whereas this game is fairly just, you know, the standard left, right, up, triangle. 
instead. Just worth mentioning. WCW World Tour debuted the incredible Aki style control scheme, something that would really stand the test of time going forward, and the control scheme found in Warzone is definitely not that, being almost completely abandoned after the second title in the series, Attitude, but not including the ECW titles. Smackdown and every future wrestling game would do away with the button combinations, and I honestly think that the wrestling world is better for it. Sure, there are people who really do enjoy this type of game, but hitting forward down square to hit a DDT instead of just a simple up and circle, or left and X, boggles my mind. I understand that it was 1998 and at the time PlayStation games hadn't even really adapted the whole analog sticks to move the camera style of gameplay yet, but this just never really sat right with me. I felt weird hitting up X circle to score a chokeslam in WCW Nitro, and I felt even odder hitting left down right triangle circle for a pedigree. Thankfully, WWF Warzone does include a move list in its pause menu, something that WCW did not, which is great. I don't have a mobile phone in the 90s to look up the cheat codes, and although I was subscribed to the official PlayStation magazine, the chance of me happening to have a full list of moves for a wrestling game at the time was pretty slim. Oh, if you have an issue with how the moves translate from real life to the game screen, or how weird they look, that's because nearly every move in this game was motion captured by the Hardy Boys. Just imagine that in your mind. Matt and Jeff Hardy spending the day covered in balls doing tombstones and choke slams to each other. When entering into a match, you'll see the heads up display, showing off the opponent's health bar and your own. This, of course, changes the color from green to red, depending on the damage that you receive. Now, the more that you hit moves, obviously, the higher the chance of winning the match when your opponent's health is in the red. On top of this, the damage bar lets you know just how much damage you're actually doing. Something that this title also has, which I haven't really seen before, is the inclusion of the crowd. The crowd will react to a different range of moves and can give you a damage multiplier, something that is actually a very interesting concept. The crowd will eventually cheer your name out loud and that will give you said damage modifier. This also plays into the charisma stat of each of the wrestlers. Having a character with a high charisma means they can achieve this stage higher, though obviously will be lacking elsewhere in skills. Now for the moves, there is a move complexity score, with moves being ranked from 1 to 9 on that scale, having moves like a shoulder breaker being the press of just O to execute, and a move like an overhead bait to the suplex being that of a high ranking move. If you go for a high ranking move and your opponent goes for a low ranking move, they will always win. If your heads up display has your name in a shade of blue and the crowd is behind you, you have a higher chance of pulling off a high ranking move. Each wrestler has their own finisher move, obviously, and is able to hit it as many times as they wish, as long as your opponent is in the red. Though due to the system that I mentioned previously, if you were to hit a move over and over again, the crowd could turn on you, meaning that your opponent could, if smart enough, turn the tide on you by having the crowd completely behind them. I kind of disagree with this. I think it would make more sense for the crowd to pop louder and louder the more old Stone Cold hits his stunner, but nonetheless, it's an interesting system if you think about it. Kind of like a punishment for winning too hard on your fallen foe. Talking of finisher moves, it's really unclear how much damage a finisher move actually does more than on any other move in the game. A Triple H, I hit Ahmed Johnson with five straight pedigrees. The first, his stun meter was done, so he just got straight back up. I then hit three more straight, and his stun meter wore off again, so he jumped straight back up. So I hit him once again for another pedigree, and went straight for the pin and got the win. Though at that point, I'm pretty sure I could have just done anything, and it would have been the end of the match. In another matchup played as Owen Hart, I used the code to call in reinforcements to ringside, which is apparently holding all of the back buttons, right bumper, left bumper, left trigger, right trigger, and then hitting another button, it was like circle or up or something like that, and this for some reason brought out Ahmed Johnson, who continued to lay out Farouk and then pin him in the middle of the ring, which led to Farouk winning by disqualification. Thanks Ahmed, really helped me out. Warzone being the first title from this game company that would look this way could pretty much be viewed as a prototype, a first attempt from a company at creating something truly different from their arcade past versions, instead leading into their newly found acclaimed ownership and going for a graphically impressive looking title. When compared directly against the WCW's recent title though, the wrestler models do look better, having a JPEG stretched over a model, the look of the other more cartoony wrestlers, and quicker moving animations and movesets, I do honestly think that WCW vs NWO World Tour is the better of the two. 
When it comes to the gameplay side of things, the Aki titles had you placing your wrestler within arm's reach of your opponent and hitting a move incredibly easily, making this title accessible to everybody who would be interested in picking it up and playing. Something that was incredibly important in the early 90s, as most people would head to a friend's house, pick up a wrestling game, play for a little while, and then ask it for Christmas. Or stand in a retail store playing Goldeneye for an entire hour whilst their mum shopped for a new TV. Yes, that story hits a little close to home because that's exactly what happened to me. Around this time period, demo discs, especially on the PlayStation side of things, gave people a feel for what a title would have to offer, and I can only imagine people's opinions upon picking up WWF Warzone for the first time in one of these discs. Personally, as somebody who was subscribed to PlayStation Magazine in the late 90s, and not becoming a wrestling fan until 2000, I don't remember playing the WWF Warzone demo at all. I'm sure it was on the disc, and I'm sure maybe I clicked it, but like... I just had like no interest in it, like the gameplay was so stale. And by that point, I was already completely brainwashed by Resident Evil and Metal Gear Solid, so... Warzone was the first attempt at a fully simulation style wrestling game, and as a first shot, yeah, it's not terrible. There is something to be said though, about these acclaimed style games, and it's a tale as old as time. And this is what I've actually heard from people quite a lot. Essentially, if you've played Smackdown, No Mercy, WCW NWO World Tour, then play Warzone afterwards, you're probably going to hate it. Now, as I just explained, I first personally got into wrestling during the late 90s and very early 2000s, so being stuck with a PlayStation, despite asking for an N64, meant that my first real taste of wrestling games that stood out to me was SmackDown released in 2000. Therefore, by the time I actually bothered to play Warzone or even Attitude, I already had tasted something so sweet. There really is no way to go from one to the other. They just don't compare in any way. Now we're going to be taking a quick look at the N64 version of Warzone. There are obvious differences in almost every way, apart from the gameplay, which is sadly left untouched. The graphics are different, the soundtrack is radically different, and that's mainly due to the fact that it is a cartridge-based game, so yeah. But the main thing about this title that I really do enjoy is the fact that the loading screens are completely gone, something that also uh, happens in Attitude if you haven't played that title. The game on the N64 though does look really different. It's smoother. There's like a motion blur put over everything. It's hard to explain, in the same way that the models and textures in WSW World Tour are worse than the PlayStation's offerings, this title on the N64 just has its own charm to it. Almost as though in losing something, it gains something else. In not being a perfectly sharp image, it instead comes across as a better image overall, at least in my eyes. The N64 version also includes a Royal Rumble mode, which is because the N64 has no loading times, and it's actually a seamless version of that match type, something that even the later SmackDown titles on the PlayStation was unable to achieve. There's even the Gauntlet mode, which is exactly the same as the Royal Rumble. The gameplay is exactly the same though. As for the sound in this title, as I say, the PlayStation version is the better of the two. You actually have the commentary and you have the wrestlers talking throughout the matches, which can lead to some very, very, very interesting moments, especially when you're beating up mankind and he's screaming like a pig. Mankind can't shake the cobwebs up. King has a real opportunity here. The other thing worth mentioning in Warzone is the introduction of a female character in a limousine. She basically shows up and taunts the player without moving her mouth, it's really kind of strange. The first time that you're introduced to her, you literally just see her boobs opening a window, which is kind of hilarious. She essentially is just there to kind of insult the player and say, hey, uh, have you seen the champion around? Nah, you probably haven't because you suck. You suck. I guess in their claims mind, they kind of saw like, oh, I know what these, these nerdy gamers want, they want a hot chick to fight for. So in between certain fights, we will we'll put in a clip of a woman in a limousine telling you, hey, if you become the champion, I'll be back to pick you up in my sweet limousine. It's very strange. I, I, don't, I don't know why they made that decision. It's, it's very strange. I actually do want to say that Having no loading screens in Warzone and Attitude is uh, it's actually like really cool. It is really, really, really cool. Um, it's something that we, we kind of have to deal with today in like life. <laughs> I don't know how to explain this. The loading times in the PlayStation version of Warzone and Attitude is pretty long on the original PlayStation. 
Uh, and given that it's the current year and I'm, I'm emulating these games on current generation hardware, so to speak, um, even now the, lo the loading times are like are pretty long. Jumping into Attitude for the N64 though, or Warzone for the N64, uh, having absolutely no load screen is like incredible. Like I cannot go into detail, I cannot stress enough how incredible it genuinely is to just jump straight into a game or jump straight into a match in Warzone or Attitude on the N64. It's very, very cool. Um, yeah, I know it's a tiny detail, but very, very cool. Really enjoyed that aspect of the game. Not having a load screen there. That, that's a positive for the N64 version. Obviously, the uh, music in the N64 version is um, almost completely absent. Um, yeah, there's the, the theme songs that the rest has come out to is basically like an 8-bit tune version, which... For 1998, it's kind of like a modern approach on making music for the game, if you think about it in that way. Uh, but obviously, it's just a way to save memory on the cartridge. So, But there's also something to be said about Stone Cold Steve Austin landing the Lufez press and then immediately telling a wrestler that he just whipped their ass. Beginning of the end. Austin 316 says, I just whipped your ass. <laughs> It's somewhat truly special that it's kind of missing in wrestling games and hasn't been around for a very long time. That's something I always thought about when playing a, any recent WWE game. Cactus Jack in Mankind, he was so loud during his matches when beating up opponents. Um, that's something that's actually really, really uh, captured in Warzone that isn't present in uh, other wrestling games, even to today. Turn off the lights! Stone Cold Steve Austin won this match, hands down! It is now time to talk about WCW NWO Revenge. The Aki Corporation by this point in time had already proven itself reliable with its previous titles, both made and released in Japan under the Virtual Pro Wrestling title and as WCW vs NWO World Tour releasing just the year prior. Reviews for the previous title upon release ranged from mixed to moderately positive, so this time around Aki felt like they had something to prove, and prove it they did. Low wrestling titles were never going to receive perfect scores across the board, mainly due to its genre of choice being that of pro wrestling, something already seen as rather niche. WCW NWO Revenge surpassed its previous release in nearly every way. Within a month it became the highest selling console game in North America, winning console fighting game of the year, and became heavily responsible for THQ's profits in late 1998 and 99 selling just shy of 1.9 million copies in the US, ranking in substantially among the best-selling N64 games of all time. So where to begin with this title? Well, I've always been interested in the idea of taking any member of the roster and customising them to join a certain faction, wrestle in street clothes, or just overall have some kind of customization to them, something that even strikes me as an original concept to this day. Though in the current titles you can edit people's attires and have them wear whatever you want, the fact that this was available in 1998 and continued to be available into 2000, then really wasn't available until 2014, is something so astounding to me. Let's start there and dive into the customization of this massive roster, as so we take a look around and get to grips with what we have in front of us. First things first, the roster. There's a really great selection here, WCW White and Black, NWO Wolfpack, Ravens, Flock and the WCW Mainstays and Imports section. All the stars are here, from Hogan to Nash, Jericho to Malenko, Bischoff to the Steiners and even Bret Hart's Foundation, having Bret and Bulldog actually feature in two games straight for two different companies. Craziness. The customization, though very limited, is still excellent to see. Being able to give guys like Hogan, Macho and Sting three different attires, and even just having two different attires on offer for guys like Cool and Nash is still awesome. Rey Mysterio and Ultimo Dragon are also two others who stand out, as they have several different attires on offer here, as they should. Raven even has a crazy shirt around my waist look, that he would come to popularise more so in his WWF run. So let's move on to our first couple of matches. First up we have the Giant, following on from every other WCW title I've played, 
have been my first match up against another big guy. It's honestly crazy to see that wrestlers had such sweet intros, but had such weird themes, an obvious limitation of the console at the time. Entrances themselves look great, complete with two different images, an entrance way and a ring animation, showing off two different sets of animations. On top of that, we even have the wrestler staying in or around the ring during the entrance itself, something else that would be missing for a long time after No Mercy, that made its exit in 2000. Now in order to fully explore this game, my first path for it will be the Cruiserweight title path and I'll be choosing Chris Jericho, my personal favourite from WCW. The first match on Jericho's tour for the Cruiserweight title was against Rey Mysterio. A great warm-up match and one of the best in the Cruiserweight division. And as you can see by my gameplay here, the more I play, the more I get used to play with how easy these controls are, and I clearly started to develop more tactics during each of my matches. I honestly have enjoyed every minute playing up Jericho's heel persona, which feels actually doable in this title. I almost felt like I'd created my own personal story during each of the matches against each of my 9 different opponents. Jericho seems to have different taunts for different ring positions, like for example when his opponent is down, or even when Jericho is rising up for one of his knees. It's possible to execute a taunt. It really does add to the realistic feel of playing one of these titles. Maybe this is what the developers of Warzone were actually going for. After Ray came Psychosis, and this is where I started to get to grips with the finisher moves and learning Jericho's movesets more and more. Up next came Dean Malenko. Despite his high profile feud with Jericho at the time on WCW television, I guess I kind of figured that he'd be later on down the line, but nonetheless, here's my Dean Dean. Ultimo Dragon came out after Dean, once I made the man of a thousand holds tap. Ultimo gave me a rerun for my money, as I used everything in Jericho's arsenal to defeat him, though he busted Jericho open. After him came Eddie Guerrero. Juvi, who once again busted up Jericho, though this time I actually won with an impressive Come on Baby style pinfall. Then came Benoit, and I ended up against Kidman, the defending WCW Cruiserweight Champion. What's really cool about this title is how it does actually remember who you've won the title with, as it's almost as though you can now list your accomplishments right here on the main menu, giving us the option to see Jericho with his beloved WCW Cruiserweight Championship whenever we mouse over him in the menu itself. Not only that, but by winning each of the championships, we actually unlock a special individual to play around with. By winning the Cruiserweight title, we unlock Kidman. I have to say, I absolutely love the gameplay in this title. Everything just flows so effortlessly. And knowing that by spending time playing through a championship career path gives me some kind of bonus at the end, it's also an incredible incentive to continue playing this title. This is my first time ever playing WCW NWO Revenge, and I have to say that it is really an interesting one to really dig your teeth into, especially coming from a kind of modern point of view on video games. Up next came the US title challenge, playing this time around as Raven a former WCW United States Champion in his own right, and cover star of this very title. Why was Raven on the front cover of one of the most famous and important wrestling games ever made? Well, maybe Sting was busy that day. Or maybe a dev just liked him. That has always been a really strange sticking point for me. If you look at the entire intro video for this very game, it's obvious that the whole story and the intro itself is based around Sting coming for Hulk Hogan. 
Hell, he even caused a truck incident by setting a Hulk Hogan tombstone on fire. Yet on the cover of this title, he isn't even pictured. It's definitely a strange one. Nonetheless, let's move forward with Raven choosing to take on several new opponents in the US title field. First up is Goldberg. The man who defeated Raven for the very title is the first person we're going up against. Again, I really have to question this totally random selection when it comes to opponents given to us. Having Goldberg as a first guy you're facing is truly ridiculous. It makes no sense, although I suppose in the 1997 WCW, Goldberg does make sense as a total rookie. But nonetheless, this guy absolutely destroys me for a little while. Luckily, like most wrestlers, Raven is a breeze to control, and working out his spots and strengths is as easy as a headlock and a suplex. I brawl with Goldberg a little more, and hilariously enough, ends up posing in the corner directly in front of him on two occasions. It's almost as though the AI doesn't really know what they're meant to do in such a situation. After scoring 10 punches in the corner, following up with Raven's signature taunt, I score a released German suplex, then follow up with an even flow DDT. Really great animation on this one, shows Raven's variation of the move, throwing himself back first, feet up, just as Raven did so at the time. Raven's next opponent is Kevin Nash, again a crazy choice for a second person to face. Somehow in this matchup I score an even flow DDT at the 1 minute mark, but Nash kicks out early. After building up some momentum I scored a number of running attacks to Nash as he was down and somehow got a free count. I have legit no idea how that happened, but it just goes to show the randomness of the matches can come to, which is great. I guess Nash was super weak from the DDT and after following up and not giving him an opening, he was easily defeated. After Nash came Booker T, Diamond Dallas Page, Brian Adams representing the NWO, and the Big Show himself, who at this point was of course going by the Giant. Benoit followed, who at this point was an incredible US Champion in his own right, and then came Scott Hall. Booker T looks great in this art style, lots of little interesting details from his nose covering to the designs on his gear. Diamond Dallas Page has some excellent entrance pyro, and keeps the gameplay feeling different than the rest of his unique moveset. Brian Adams actually gave an incredible fight here, having a run in benefit him greatly from Chris Benoit. At one point, Brian's completely turned the tide of the match, grabbing me and throwing me directly into the turnbuckle at the end of the ring. This caused Raven's head to burst open into a bloody mess, and gave Brian an opening to score his finishing move. Luckily, I managed to kick out and come back with some offense and close this matchup with another small package. After a low blow, I turned the tide on Benoit, and although he tried his best to counter and dodge the even flow DDT, it was of no use as I nailed him with it. Low to my surprise, he actually kicked out. It really is interesting to see how different each opponent feels to fight in this title. Wherever somebody like the Giant and Kevin Nash use a lot of power moves, their style never really slows down the gameplay itself. Whereas somebody like Benoit may try to use several types of suplexes to throw you around the ring. Once you're back in control, it's easy to get to the rhythm of hitting one move after another to pick up the win itself. Benoit took another couple minutes worth of damage and ended up just taking several more shots to the head to finally be down for the count. This time, this time the win coming from a small package. It was time to take on the champion himself, Mr. Perfect, Kurt Hennig. After a back and forth, I ended up getting into the groove of Raven's 1-2 finisher combo. A release belly to back suplex followed up immediately by an even flow DDT, and the US Championship and the ability to play as Mr. Perfect was mine. WCW NWO Revenge overall looks and plays great. I could understand how at the time the lack of accurate wrestling music and overall absolutely nothing, zero story mode, would drive a die-hard WCW fan to despair playing this title for a long period of time. Absolutely no cutscenes outside of the stellar back and forth gameplay and replays that are shown. So you've kind of got a double-edged sword in our hands. What's more important in the long term, gameplay versus story? Well, personally, I'd like both, but seeing as 1998 gave us three titles with no stories to tell, besides those that we make up on the spot during some incredible matches, it's definitely a very interesting time to be a wrestling fan and to play wrestling games. I can see how fans of this title could keep going back to it after all these years. Finding the draw of an interesting match could completely shadow over the need for commentary, match types, or interesting music. 
That is another strange thing that I would assume is carried over from the Japanese side of things. No cage matches, no ladders, no lumberjacks, no tables. And let's face it, if you have played WCW World Tour before this, you may have been rather disappointed to get into WCW in the Revenge. Weapons mode has been significantly expanded though, with more brutal objects than ever before. What this basically means is that the weapons on offer here are a hilarious collection of briefcases, stop signs, trash cans, chains, pipes, chairs, bats and more. All of which can be found in the audience. It really would have been cool for this match to have been included in any of the championship paths that I took, as I eventually found myself hungry for some hardcore action after taking on the challenge of the championship's based career mode. A mode which offered strictly one-on-one -on -one contests. Some Fatal 4 ways Battle Royale, Triple Threats, anything of the sort would have been a treat. As in the original, realism mode provides the necessary blood, and this time the cart will save it the on position, so you won't have to always switch it on manually. The graphics had some major improvements here, and I totally admit how impressed I was by the entrances on hand. Complete motion of the wrestlers walking down to the ring had me hooked for the longest time. And I even remember back in 2001, before WWF Just Bring It had released, already feeling nostalgic and wanting for an N64 style experience when it comes to how well these titles were played. And after Just Bring It came out, I still felt that way, even for a little while. Everything here ticks all the boxes in the ring and on the way to the ring, but it definitely is lacking something a bit more solid. Oh, and let's not forget the voice and likeness of referee Mark Curtis, who did an excellent job. Again, I would have loved to have had a solid referee in the ring, but I'm sure that's coming down the pipeline eventually. Right, Aki? I would have loved to see Aki get another shot at a wrestling title for WCW. Imagine the absolutely ridiculous style of game we could have gotten in place of whatever they ended up making next. Unfortunately, for WCW fans, this would of course be the last Aki title that they would create for the company. But as for wrestling fans on the whole, we were eating good, and will continue to do so for the next couple of years. From our pals at Ukes, a name you're going to be hearing more and more as we move forward, comes Tuokan Ritsudin III, a member of the Shin Nippon Pro Wrestling Wrestling Family, developed by Ukes and published by Tomi Corporation, which was released in Japan in 1998. And this title is truly something special. It's such a shame that I can't speak Japanese. Nonetheless, this title visually and through audio is just honestly something very different. Tulkin Ritsudan 3 is the third and last sequel for the PlayStation console, maintaining its wonderful polygon graphics, large range of moves and smooth game control. It also would appear that the names of the moves appear at the bottom of the screen after each one is performed. Now I'm just assuming as that's a feature that was available in the later Nukes titles, like WWF Smackdown, but from just looking and listening to this title and taking it all in, it's really incredible to see that in 1998 there's a fully functioning referee standing in the ring at all times. Sure there isn't any entrances for wrestlers, but again, much like the later titles I've mentioned today lacking a story mode, this could once again be a case of gameplay making up for what it's lacking elsewhere. Talking of the referee, this one is definitely on the ball and able to count pinfalls, look for submissions as well as counting a wrestler when they're in the ropes before a disqualification may be made. The animations on offer here are excellent. Now I'm a massive New Japan fan, though a lot of the darker years of NJPW are obviously lost on me. Even so, it's always incredible to dive into an older Japanese-based wrestling title like this one, offering up 39 wrestlers with Jushin Thunder Liger, Benoit, Sasuke, Otani, the Steiners, Inoki, both young and old, Shono, Tenzin, Kojima, and lots more all on offer here. This may be one to check out if you're interested in these kind of wrestling titles, especially on the original PlayStation. It's honestly hard to believe that the PlayStation 1 had this kind of processing power for 1988. Given what we saw previously with Nitro and WWF Warzone, of course, the wrestlers are blocky, but very clearly you can tell who a certain wrestler is based on their attire choice, and small details are on offer here. Tag matches in this title look really cool, with wrestlers jumping in the ring to help out with double team spots and creating memorable highlights, and the Great Muta even uses his green mist, which is pretty damn cool. That brings us to the end of 1998 and I really hope you enjoyed my look into this time period, what was essentially the best and most successful period for WCW in the ring and on the N64 console. And from what I understand, that's essentially the peak of the WCW run of video games. Though, unfortunately, we're not done with them yet. I'll see you in 1999.